Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Where is my cumin? I have been working at Ralph's grocery store for 8 months now, and this story starts first month into my employment. It was raining outside and I was braving the elements to bring in carts for customers, and a lady, I will call her Mrs. Wonderful, decides it is my fault that none of the available carts are dry, directing her very loud and aggressive voice past the stand with paper towels to dry the carts, right at me. I begin fuming inside at this entitled witch who is too good for the elements, but I smile and wipe down her cart for her. I tell her that if customers brought their carts up to the front after unloading their groceries, none of them would be wet, but she disregarded my statements, and later left her cart in the middle of one of the handicapped spots, for it to get rained on. The gears have begun to turn in my head. Months go by, with her coming in about twice a week to buy $300 worth of expensive wine and vegan groceries, for her very wealthy husband I assume, based on her massive ring and Porsche Carrera GT. And then I became a cashier, and I saw my opportunity. Whenever I worked, I would watch for her, and when she got in line I would hop on a register and call her over to my line to check out. Everything was ready for my revenge. At our first encounter behind the register, I slipped her salt off the belt to the side, because the only reason people buy salt is because they are out, and basically everything needs salt. I don't ring it up, it's not on the receipt, it's not in her bags, and it's not hers. Perfect. She comes in the next day, only for salt, and with a very unhappy look on her face, I smirk. I do this a couple more times, not every time, because this is a long play, and I cannot get caught, but about every third time. But I think she is about to put two and two together, so I move to phase two of the plan. I start to take items off her belt at other cashier's register. She comes in screaming at my manager because her items keep going missing. On the day before, I had taken the cumin from her belt on another cashier's register. Mrs. Fantastic Speed walks in, arms are swinging, and walks up to the 58-year-old gentleman who had rung her up the day before, and yells, where is my ducking cumin, and he started laughing. Made this all worth it, and made me want to continue this to the next level. Mrs. Compassionate then storms over to my manager, who says she will look into it but never does because she thinks Mrs. Forgiving is just looking for free groceries. Then Mrs. Giving begins to stare intently at the belt when she is checking out. Hell, what am I going to do now? So whenever I am sweeping the floors and I see her, I steal an item from Mrs. Sharing's basket. Even watching the belt she sees nothing happening, yet her butter, an egg, yes, only a single egg from the carton, some spices, the occasional meat, and when I'm feeling really ballsy, a bottle of wine, gets put swiftly back on the shelf. I can visibly see her breaking down week after week, Looking in her cart to make sure everything is there every minute, watching the belt, being aggressive and hateful to the cashiers. I step it up another notch. I start to not steal her groceries, but swap them with the competitors' brands. I have no idea if she notices, but it makes me feel good inside to think that she is confused when she gets home. One particular night I replaced her $50 bottle of wine with a $3 bottle which I had stored under the register, one that looks eerily similar to the one she bought, and I think I saw her start to tear up when I rang the correct one up for the next day. At least I hope that's what I saw. One month ago I decided to lay off this woman because I think I broke her enough to say I've gotten my revenge. That didn't stop her from still checking over her shoulder, watching the belt, staring at the screen that tallies up the order every time she is in the store. But, she still leaves her cart in the lot and doesn't put it away, so I am still taking items out of her cart every once in a while, just to keep her on edge, anxious, and fearful, and will continue to haunt her shopping experience, forever. So Mrs. Delightful, thank you for shopping at Ralph's, where you get real low prices, and a fast checkout. The next one is titled, Screw Me? Screw you, I want my money. About 30 years or so ago I was 17 and about to head to university. An acquaintance through my parents' church offered me a job working with him learning to be a pizza chef. Awesome, I'd need money for uni and I'd already had a stack of jobs, so working hard was nothing new for me, but being a cook certainly was. My experience with Italian was limited to Pizza Hut. So I accepted that at the start I was a liability, not a help. I started work, and to start with I worked free. 
cool, but when it got to the point about three months later that I was opening by myself and taking whole shifts by myself, well, I should be paid. I screwed up all of my 17-year-old courage and confronted the owner, let's call him Nick, because that was his name. He huffed and puffed and tried to tell me how terrible I was, but I stood my ground and now I'm on minimum wage. Not bad in my eyes at the time. I worked there for another three years, through most of my uni degree, often putting in 30 hours contact at uni, 30 hours at the restaurant and 30 hours of study, it was hectic, but just became the norm. Towards the end I became a lot savvier, and started researching labor laws, keeping records of my pay packets and end of year tax receipts and realized Nick, and other co-owners, were screwing me. I wasn't on the correct rate, they weren't deducting tax correctly and a couple of other accounting, oversights. By then I was working with my, at the time, mate, let's call him girlfriend creeping dickhead, GCD. It was Sunday night, the place was packed I had tickets all the way down my line and GCD and I were pumped. We had a new boss, NB, who'd just bought into the business who thought he was the king of the world because he was now a restaurateur, a right wanker. But after years of having to stay back to cook pizzas on World Cup nights for the boss's friends, or Churstmas, New Year's Eve, etc. I was sorta used to the grandstanding chest puffing behavior. The night in question the new boss would not let me start the second pizza oven, think a two-tier oven, I was only allowed the top tier on, because it cost too much. So here I am, oven full, two pizza chefs running full speed and we're only falling behind, because one oven wasn't enough and it was starting to cool down from being so full and open so frequently. NB gets a couple of tables of mates in. Instead of just asking us to cook some comp garlic bread or whatever, he starts loading up trays himself and putting them in the oven, not the worst crime, but because he had no idea what he was doing, every 30s he'd open the oven to check them, cooling the oven down even further, potentially ruining the food we had in there and slowing us down measurably. I had the head chef chewing my butt out as his food was ready to go but my food on the same tickets wasn't. It was hectic and not fun. This garlic bread bandit crap had to stop. Me, NB, stop ducking with my oven. If you want garlic bread, just ask, I'll get it done immediately for you. NB, what? Ha. Huh. Me, you're messing with my oven, you're cooling it down and we're too busy for this crap, just tell me and I'll make it. NB, okay. Did he do it? Nope, he kept on. Cue the same conversation another two times, the last time I told him I'd blow my stack if he did it again. You see where this is going. He did it again. Now, after being consistently ripped off and abused, so many kooky stories from that place, for three years, my time was up there anyway, and this was the time to do it. I looked at GCD and said, yo. We out of here, he looked back and simply said, yup. We stripped our aprons and in front of the entire restaurant, pizza kitchen was in full view of the entire restaurant, threw them on the bench and told NB, we quit, all this, all these tickets, all the food in the oven you've ducked up, and your mate's shitty garlic bread, this is all yours now, good luck, then we walked out, got some coffees from the baristas, sat in front of the pizza area and watched him absolutely flounder. He had no idea what he was doing and there was literally no one else there that could help him. We could see food coming out from the kitchen, but the pizza on the same ticket was taking 20 minutes or more longer to come out. Tables were hopping mad, we could hear the grumblings all around us. I'll admit it was dickish, but undeniably satisfying to behold. That's not the pro revenge though. The pro revenge was that I'd been stealing my timesheet every Sunday night, photocopying it and then replacing it Monday mornings. I'd been doing that for over a year. I'd also told GCD to do it. Monday I walk in and Nick was there and was furious at me, as I walking in you could see his chubby face turn bright red as he bellowed across the restaurant floor, what the hell do you think you're doing here? Get the hell out and never come back. Me, Nick, we've gotta talk. We can do it here or we can do it in your office, but trust me, you want to have this conversation privately. Nick, fine, you come with me then, desperately trying to gain the upper hand back, and he storms to his shitty little office out the back, Nick, bullshit, 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 about how he's going to withhold pay and a whole heap of other illegal hot air. Me, you done? Good. Here, read this, I hand him a print out of an Excel spreadsheet, a stack of photocopied timesheets, a stack of photocopied pay slips, printed copied of the wage awards, all of which detail the amount he's ripped me off for. Me, you owe me six grand. I'll take cash or a check now. Did I mention he and the other bosses had just been simultaneously raided by the tax office and that they and the business were all on thin ice? Yeah, bad timing for Nick the dick. 
Nick, spluttering, wringing his hands, but, but, I can't afford it. Look I'll show you my bank accounts, as he physically starts scrambling to find his bank statements. Me, Nick I literally don't give a crap about you, your bank accounts or your situation, you owe me 6 grand today or I take all of this to the tax office and all of the other relevant government departments that will be very interested in this, because Nick. I have a feeling if you're doing this to me, you're doing it to other staff here as well huh? As for not having the money, well, again, not my problem, but you just bought a new $60,000 Pajero, so if you have to run that down to the car yard and sell it, again I don't give a crap, but I get 6 grand today. He literally teared up a little, I'm not sure why, maybe through frustration, rage or just being screwed by someone he though way beneath him. But seeing a grown man who's abused you for many years cry at your hands is a pretty beautiful thing to behold as a 20 year old kid. I got a check that day for my whole 6 grand, and yes, it cashed, but the best was walking out of his office with GCD standing there who deadpan just looked him in the eyes and said, Nick, we need to talk, and in they walked in to do the same thing. $10,000 he lost that day. The best part? A few of my friends at the restaurant caught wind of the fact that I had enraged him and asked what it was all about, I let them know how they were being screwed, how to take copies of all of their timesheets, and where to find the relevant laws. I know of several other people who did the same thing to him. And that was how I left the hospitality industry and started working in my field of study, never to look back. The next one is titled, Better Check Your Facts, Because People Know People. The internet has evolved quite a lot over the years. Some people may remember Usenet groups, I know I do, used to have a lot of fun reading them. Kind of similar in a way to today's Reddit in a way, no matter what the subject was, someone would have a Usenet news group for it. But unlike today's Reddit, it was strictly text. You could download images, but they would take forever to download, and could often be across several different messages, just one of the messages missing, and you wouldn't get the image. Things then improved, download speeds slowly got faster, and then there was IRC that came about. IRC saw the same thing, there was chat room for anything and everything, dot and if there wasn't, you could clearly create it. If you were to try to watch a video over the internet back then, it could take you a couple of hours to download a music video, dot you get the idea. This is important for the context of the story. I was a writer on a couple of wrestling newsletters during the mid to late 90s. We only published our newsletters online, dot you could have it emailed to you, or go to a website to read it think we hosted on Geocities or Tripod. Both wrestling newsletters were independent of each other, and I used different nicknames on each. One was more a review and preview newsletter, where we would post reviews of the most recent shows, events, talk about current feuds, and talk about what we may think will happen in the next big event. The other newsletter, was a news and rumors newsletter, with a few fun puzzles, competitions thrown in to keep things interesting. At the time, you had a few big name wrestling news and rumors websites, and a handful of small ones. I was a writer on one of the small ones. Sometimes we would get news and rumors from the big name websites, giving them credit where appropriate. Sometimes, we would hear things from people in the business, everyone had their sources of information. And sometimes we would make an educated guess on possible scenarios, based on current trends in the industry. It did get a bit cutthroat at times, with some newsletters claiming that they broke the news first, when it had already been published in other newsletters first. And you would even have some newsletters devote all of their time trying to rubbish the other newsletters for publishing false and misleading information. It was rumors, we did not always get it right. Through a couple of readers of my first wrestling newsletter, I learned of a huge surprise in the works for one organization, which could potentially lead to something happening at a big event coming up. I won't mention the surprise, but it involved a person from another sport. No other wrestling newsletter had reported it, so I included it as a rumor on the second wrestling newsletter. I was instantly rubbished by one of the major wrestling newsletters at the time, publishing a clearly nonsense rumor that would never happen, only for that very same newsletter to publish the exact same rumor two or three days later, and claim to be the first ones to publish it. This sort of stuff happened all the time, it did not bother me at all. Anyway, I happened to have a few wrestlers who actually read my first newsletter, no big names as such, but a couple of lesser known wrestlers in the big organizations. I knew who they were, but refused to reveal their identities back then, and refused to reveal them now. One of them let me know of an unknown fact from a major match a couple of years earlier, it was to do with an injury that happened during a part of the match. This fact had never been published anywhere else at the time. 
I mentioned that I wrote for another wrestling newsletter that dealt with news and rumors, and asked if I could repeat the information. The wrestler said sure, but not to credit him. So I go ahead and publish the rumor. Straight away I had another of the smaller wrestling newsletters say that it was nonsense. They said that it was impossible for the match to have continued, had the injury happened. They then started a smear campaign on the second newsletter, I was getting spam emails constantly, virus attempts originating from the competition, the competition even went so far as claiming that they had the full story of my wife of 10 years working as a hooker, don't ask, they were trying to find anything to smear me with. There was more sinister and disgusting stuff, but I won't write it here. Why it got so personal, I do not know, but the funny thing was that at the time, I was a 22-year-old single university student, and if I had a wife of 10 years who was working as a hooker, I would have had to marry her when I was 12. But his smear campaign was working, our readership dropped by nearly 50%. It was time to get some revenge, although I had no idea just how far the revenge would end up reaching. Firstly, I approached one of the bigger wrestling newsletters. They would often run ads at the bottom or rear of their newsletters, for, affiliated newsletters. I organized a new affiliation with them, removing an affiliation they had with the competition. Small potatoes. I started promoting the second newsletter heavily on Usenet, in some of the wrestling groups, which ultimately led to an increase in our email subscription base, greater than what it was before his smear campaign. This negated any effect that his smear campaign had, dot, but I was hungry for more. I wanted to shove it where the sun don't shine, so I contacted those wrestlers who read my first newsletter. I explained the situation to them, and they were happy to help out. It took a couple of weeks, but eventually I was able to post a link to a 15-second video hosted on a Geocities webpage, as well as on a wrestling Usenet group, where the wrestler at the center of the injury rumor not only confirmed it, but gave a shout out to my second newsletter. While it validated me and my information, it still didn't shut the other guy up. Finally, a break. While the guy used an alias for his newsletter, he did actually mention his name a couple of times, and where in the US he attended university. Using this information, I was able to get a friend in the US to do some searching for me, attended that very same university, and discovered that the guy had actually completed a journalism degree several years earlier. Further research indicated that he was now working as a reporter for a regional newspaper in the US. His wrestling newsletter must just be a hobby. So I decided to send all of the information I had, his smear campaign etc, to the newspaper office. I don't know what, if anything, it would do, dot, but it was worth a shot. About a month later, I got an email back from the newspaper, thanking me for the information. They discovered that he was using the newspaper's system to run the wrestling newsletter, which was against their policy, so they fired him. And because the newspaper was part of a chain of regional newspapers across the US, he was going to struggle to find another journalism job. The newsletter got shut down as well, because without the newspaper's system to run it, the guy had no way of continuing with the newsletter. Side note. I ended up finishing with my newsletters not long after anyway. The first newsletter, as I was just a writer for it, I finished up with it when the owner of the newsletter decided to close it down, he didn't have the time to devote to it due to work commitments. The second one, I started off as just a writer, contributor, then took over their competitions, then eventually took over the whole newsletter, original owner didn't want to do it anymore. But in the end, I was finishing up at university, I had to move on with my career, so I closed it down. The next one is titled, Oh, you want to steal a spot? So this happened in the largest metropolis in Ontario, right as COVID was starting to hit the fan. My family and I were at a basketball tournament and we were staying at a hotel. We had a two-hour break between games and decided to grab some snacks from Walmart. We had been in the hotel for two nights, not paying much attention to the news, had we known the toilet paper and hand sanitizer rush was beginning we would have avoided Walmart. So grab our shit in this frenzy, thought it was normal high city pace and head back to car. I pulled in the parking space which is odd for me. I'm just about to back up and notice the blue car ahead of me is pulling out too. Perfect. Just then this moron decides she is passing a res car who is waiting for the blue spot. Thing is blue car can't get out now and lady won't move, keep a pointing for the blue car to turn, it's one way, the other way. Finally the red car moves so the blue car can get out. Now here is the revenge as I see this happening. I pull behind blue car into spot and stop. Lady stars honking at me. I look up and ignore her. 
Red car circles around and pulls in behind me, in my original spot. I edge up and red car follows me into the blue spot. The next one is titled, one of the guys became one of the unemployed. It was my supervisor. It got to the point that I had decided to quit. I had my resignation letter in my purse, but decided to let his boss know why I was quitting. My supervisor would talk about all the people on our team constantly, but only behind their backs. I got so sick of telling him to cut it out. My husband and I happened to work at the same place, different departments, and my supervisor would make crude and inappropriate comments about threesomes with him what hotel we picked for our afternoon delight, stuff like that. It was so uncomfortable. Apart from this he spent most of his supervising time outside taking smoke breaks. The problem was that my supervisor was one of the guys and I was the only girl. It turns out his boss was disgusted and told a higher up boss who lost his mind. They started an investigation which took three days. They interviewed staff, they corroborated what I said. They checked the security cameras, saw he was spending most of his work day outside, and was fired. When he was told that he was fired, he guessed that I was the person who complained and tried to get to me to apologize that I took it the wrong way. The best feeling was my co-workers surrounding me as he was walked out. That was a lovely ending to it all. The last one is titled, Date Me or Else. I worked in a call center once with a female supervisor, and she was a particularly awful person. Long story short, she hated me because I would refuse to date her. She asked multiple times and multiple times I explained very nicely that I was not interested but would like to remain friends. After about the third time, she started giving me negative marks for reviews, phone calls and such. One day she pulled me into the office with another manager and proceeded to write me up for talking on my personal phone during work hours. I had not done this. I looked at her and refused to do this and walked out of her office and into the department manager's office. This was my first complaint after about three years with this company. I explained the situation and advised what had been transpiring for months now. Apparently someone else had seen this about a month ago and had already gone to management about what she was doing to me. Within 10 minutes, she was pulled into the office and demoted back down to my position but in another department. The thing that sucked is that this department sat directly across from me. Thanks for listening.